Hey, Salt Lake, it's Allie, and I want you to know that we are hiring. CityCast Salt Lake is looking for a senior account executive to join our team. The benefits and compensation are great. We have probably too much fun, and we are pretty good at crushing our goals. If you care about this podcast and our newsletter, have some sales experience, and know a lot of people in the Salt Lake Valley, you should apply. Get all the details at citycast.fm slash jobs. Here's what Salt Lake's talking about. Tina Valderrama became a household name for many Salt Lakers after hers was one of seven houses demolished in the Guadalupe neighborhood to make way for a brand new apartment complex. Protests erupted. Westside residents fed up with the impacts of gentrification said Tina's story was textbook. Though she didn't own her duplex, she had lived there for six years. It was where she nursed her father in his final days, and it was where she was raising her grandchildren. Tina was able to find new housing in her budget, but it was in Murray, 10 miles south of her former community. Which brings us to today, two years later. That apartment complex that displaced her, it still hasn't been built. And though her rent is now twice what it was, Tina Valderrama is back. It's Thursday, June 29th. I'm Ali Vallarta, and this is CityCast Salt Lake. Tina Valderrama, we are sitting in your new home in the Guadalupe, Rose Park, sort of half-half neighborhood. Paint a picture for me. Like, where where are we? Well, I am in a two-bedroom. I'm right off of the North Temple Bridge, right kind of back where I was before, so I'm very comfortable. And brand new appliances, wonderful new apartment, everything remodeled. They accepted my pets, and it's wonderful. I like it here. Yeah. And as it happens, we are directly across the street from the home that you were displaced from by developers two years ago. Yes. It's very interesting to have gotten this place because I did look for other apartments, filled out other applications. But this was the one that came through in the end. And I don't think it's a mistake. (laughs) No, it's one hell of a coincidence. So you, your grandkids, and your two pets moved away briefly to Murray, but you fought to come back. Why? I did. I fought very hard to come back. When it happened, I felt like they were taking away my way of life, Mm. and I still had to commute back to this neighborhood to go send the kids to school. I still shopped down here, so I only slept in Murray, but I still spent my days down here in this side of town. That's a lot of effort. I mean... Why was it worth it? I wasn't willing to give up every part of my life just because they displaced me. I wasn't willing to uproot the kids from school. That's the only school they'd ever been to. And I, we were already so upset that I didn't want any more stress. And so I, it was easier for me just to come back and do what I needed down here rather than try to make my way down there. Yeah. How long were you in Murray? I was in Murray two years, and I, had, I fought very hard to save up the money to get out of there. Mm-hmm. How has the character of the neighborhood changed since you've come back? Oh, it's been wonderful. Just from the very first night I moved in, I was able to sit out there all night long and unload the U-Haul and leave the U-Haul open. And you cannot leave anything unattended to in Murray. They are in your car all, all the time. I mean, it is not safe for you or your belongings. You have to watch your back every single second. And I feel so much more relaxed. And that's important for me and my anxiety. Yeah. Have you noticed changes in the neighborhood? Because a lot can happen in two years in Salt Lake City. A whole lot has happened. I've noticed different people. I don't really think it's a coincidence that I ended up here. I looked for different apartments, but yet I ended up right across the street. How interesting that is, because I get to look at that hole in the ground every day that I was displaced for. Yeah. Now you're the chaperone of the hole. Yes. We are setting up a a cleaning day for it. We want to clean all the garbage. Well... A lot of your old neighbors are gone now. So what's the value of coming back to your neighborhood when the faces aren't familiar anymore? Well, there are still some familiar faces, but you're right. Um, A lot of them are gone. And I still want to help this neighborhood. I'm still part of it, I feel like. And I was going to move back into this area. I looked for places in other areas, but they were not priced anywhere where I needed them to be. And even this one was out of my range. 
everything has gone up and you have to make a choice. You have to say, okay, I'm willing to work harder and make more money to survive because everything's gone up or people keep going downhill and the gap's getting bigger and bigger. Can I ask you what kind of sacrifices you are making to be here? Like, are you working a second job? Not quite sure what to do with myself right now. I know that I have to find work, but I'm just not quite sure. I'm, I'm not sure if I can still work with the public the same way after mm. everything I've been through with yeah. my parents. And, you know, I just I need to be sure of who I am and what I can do. But I do need to earn money. Um, I need to get out there. And I don't have the money that I had before. In Murray, I at least had money to, to shop if I needed to, to take the kids for clothes. I don't have that any longer. And so I need to be able to make that up in some way. You brought up your parents. I know in the past you've said that this place is sacred to you, this community, because it's where your dad passed away. Yes. I nursed him right across the street, and I go over there every day still and pray. And it means a lot to me. I just feel connected to him there. Yeah. Place is a funny thing, right? Yes. It is amazing how it can make us feel. Like smells, and there's all the sort of dynamic pieces. Yeah. There is. How do your grandkids feel being back? They're very happy. They're very. I asked them if they're, they had the same amount of friends or if their friends had moved. They said a lot of them are gone. Mm-hmm. And that was sad because a lot of those kids that were displaced were in their class. And they had to move out of the neighborhoods. I don't know if a lot of people are trying to come back the way I have. Hmm. Why do you think that is? You know, I think if they move away and they move away to a place where they can be settled, it's not that fabulous to have to move again two years later. But I was put in a place that was horrible. It was horrid for kids. They could not go out and walk the dogs. They could not do anything there. They had no freedom. A place that had over 500 units and not one place for the children to play. Not one slice of grass for them to go. Most kids played in the parking lot or on the tracks. My kids weren't allowed outside because of all the danger. Hmm. How do you know they're happy here? I can see that in their face. They're happy to go to the club across the street. They have more opportunities available to them because I'm more lenient with them. I'm not so, you know, guarding them all the time. Yeah. Uh, I can really let my hair down a little bit down here. Yeah. What cl- Are you talking about the Boys and Girls Club? Yes. Right when we were being displaced, they were building the Eccles Sport Boys and Girls Club. And I was just so upset that they kicked out all the children off the block. And then the club was built. So now they get to enjoy that club. Yeah. And a lot of their friends do go there. They serve them lunch and dinner every day at five. And that helps me financially because then I don't have to feed them for those meals. Well, Salt Lake City is experiencing a lot of growing pains, rapid growth, uh, a lack of affordable housing. How would you like to see the city keep people in their neighborhoods? I think you just said the key word is keep people in their neighborhoods. Um, A lot of the things I've noticed, quit messing with the neighborhoods, quit tearing them apart. This one, a lot of it was torn apart and nothing even went up in the place. They tore my house down, nothing's still there. It's been two years. Certainly the project should have been at least solidified before they displaced seven families with nowhere to go. Yeah. Has the community played a role in your ability to return here? Like, have there been groups or forces that have been a part of your return? Yes, the Brown Berets did help me raise some money to help me with my deposit here. Who are the Brown Berets, for anyone who doesn't know? Well, they just showed up at my door one day. There's a whole group, and they organize all kinds of things for this neighborhood. And they said that they were tired of seeing their neighborhood just fall apart. That we had a certain way of living down here, all of our stores... And it's just all falling apart. And they always take care of me and help me with anything that I'd like to plan or get together. And I feel very, very lucky to have them by my side. I still remember when it all first started happening and they started to bring the notices. And I felt so sunk. And they knocked on my door and they said, let's talk. It's interesting you use the word sunk. It feels so, like, it's so resonant. Like, I can just picture it. I think for a lot of people... Being displaced from their home is so absolutely exhausting. Where do you find the energy? That's the hard part. You just have to keep going. Giving up is the easiest thing you can do. And so many people do it. And, you know, it breaks my heart. And I like to help people. But you also need to be willing to help yourself. I look at the kids every day and I know that I can't give up. I know that I have to keep going and I have to stay strong. Is there anything else you think that I should ask you about or that we haven't talked about? You know, I was up all night thinking and 
just, I want these people around here, the homeless, that I help feed and I care about, I help give clothes. I want them to matter to uh, the people higher up as much as they matter to me. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking and brainstorming, and I think the only way that I could ever do that is to get all of them, help get some kind of program to help all of them get their IDs and become registered voters. I think they would pay attention to all of those homeless people in the tents if they were registered voters. Do you think more political activism is in your yes. future? Yes. yes. You didn't hesitate. Um, whether it's just voicing my opinion or just pushing someone along for some reason, whatever, I'm not afraid to speak and people are willing to listen. And that's the difference. Would you have said that you were a political person before you were displaced from your home, or has this catalyzed something for I you? I wasn't really a political person. My, it was just that my parents had just died. I was just getting ready to face the world on my own, and they swooped in and took the only thing in my life that I do not own, which was the property. I don't even have credit cards because I won't live out of my means. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in living that way. I mean, I was solid. I was good there. I thought I was going to be able to heal, and then I had to deal with all that, and I was like, no, this is not right. This is not right. What gives them the right to come in my neighborhood and just tear the block up? It, I still feel jaded. I still feel that it was wrong. And every time I look across the street, I know it was wrong because there's still nothing there. When you're standing alone, it's very hard. When people start standing with you, you can make a difference. Tina Valderrama, thank you so much for welcoming us into your home to chat. I really appreciate yes, it. I feel proud to welcome you in, into this home. And I feel thankful for this opportunity. So I really appreciate it. When protests over Tina's displacement erupted two years ago, one of the calls from activists was to put all West Side development on hold until Salt Lake City finished its gentrification study, thriving in place. In July of last year, that study wrapped up, and here's a bit from the findings report. Quote, There are no more affordable neighborhoods in Salt Lake City where lower-income families can move once displaced. The study also found that, and here's another quote, Patterns of displacement reflect historic patterns of discrimination and segregation, with areas experiencing high displacement risk closely aligning with areas that were redlined in the past. So what do we do now? Well, for the city's part, they turned these findings into a plan of action, and they would like your thoughts on it. I put a link to the plan in the show notes. That public comment period ends tomorrow, June 30th. So read it and act fast. That is all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. Thank you for listening. We will be back tomorrow morning with more from around this city. Bye.